Okay, uh, this is an episode of the Terra Incognita podcast. I've been doing a series on the, the discovery of Australia. This is episode seven of that series, but I think you should be able to listen to this episode without having listened to those previous six. Um, so it's a standalone episode. It's on the life and legacy of Captain Cook. If you enjoy it, I would highly recommend that you subscribe to the Patreon. There's uh, six previous episodes that you'll be able to access on this topic. And it also uh, really helps me out and encourages me to keep on doing what I'm doing. I'd like to thank everyone who's already subscribed. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the episode. Thank you very much. Okay, this is episode seven on the discovery of Australia. In this episode, we're finally going to talk about Captain James Cook. I rushed to get this episode done in an attempt to release it on January 26th, which is of course Australia Day. Now unfortunately, I didn't get it done in time. I only started preparing this episode like maybe five days ago, and uh, I almost uploaded it yesterday, which would have meant I uploaded it on Australia Day, but I didn't feel like I had said everything that needed to be said. So I decided to delay the upload. Today is the day after Australia Day. Nevertheless, uh, the topic of Captain Cook is still very much in people's minds because less than 48 hours ago, a statue of Captain Cook was toppled. I'll play a quicker news clip that explains what happened. A statue of Captain Cook was sawn off at the ankles overnight in a confronting protest ahead of Australia Day. But many people will still be celebrating, the country's oldest flag maker saying it's had a bumper year. In the dead of night, vandals target a statue of Captain James Cook that had stood there for 90 years. Spraying on the plinth, the colony will fall. The so-called civil resistance youth movement then moved to a Queen Victoria statue nearby, splashing it with red paint. This morning, Cook was carted away. Okay, so this is the seventh episode, as I said. If you think back to episode one of this series, you'll remember that I spoke about the symbolic significance of statues. I spoke about the fact that a statue isn't just a piece of heritage. It's obviously an exhortation to think, feel, and act in a certain way. You're literally putting someone on a pedestal and sort of saying, this is what an ideal man looks like. This is something that you should aspire to be. That's why revolutionary forces throughout history have always destroyed the statues and symbols of the old regime. You need to destroy these statues and symbols to make way for a new type of man. You need to cut off people's connection with the past so you can make them anew. Uh, so you so you top all the old statues, you put up new ones. Um, this has happened again and again throughout history. Now on Jan 26, uh, 2024, at about three in the morning, a bronze statue of Captain Cook was cut down. The statue is over 90 years old. It has been taken away by the council and there's a debate going on about whether it should be returned or not. In this episode, I'm going to give you an overview of Captain Cook's life. I'm going to pay particular attention to his first voyage in which he discovered the east coast of Australia. At the end of the episode, I'm going to weigh in on this debate. So this episode is about the life and legacy of Cook. But before we talk about Cook, I'd like to briefly recap what was spoken about in the last episode. In episode 6, we spoke about the rise of England as a maritime power and Dampier's trip to Australia. William Dampier visited Australia twice. On both occasions, he was unimpressed with what he saw. Like the Dutch before him, he considered this continent a barren, desolate land. And yet, interest in Australia exploded after Dampier's visit. The English had been interested in Australia before Dampier. Queen Elizabeth's court astronomer, John Dee, argued that the English should colonize Terra Australis as early as 1576. Uh, In his book, The Great Volume of Famous and Rich Discoveries, John Dee argued that Elizabeth should create an empire based on English colonies in the Great South Land. The English actually drew up plans to explore Terra Australis in the 1570s, but these plans were abandoned out of fear of Spanish retaliation. So English interest in Australia predated Dampier, but it was fairly limited. When Dampier published his first book, 
um, which gave an, an account of his time in Australia, popular interest in Australia exploded. People loved reading about this foreign land on the other side of the world. But commercial interest was limited. Dampier's descriptions of Australia interested the reading public, but they did not greatly interest the merchants of London. Dampier's description of Australia seemed to confirm what the Dutch had said before him, namely that Australia was a desolate, desolate land of no commercial value. Nevertheless, uh, people did remain interested in Australia. It seemed unlikely that such a large continent could be valueless. The east coast of the country remained unknown. Perhaps there was something of value to be discovered there. But the British were not in a position to find out. They spent most of the 18th century fighting for control of North America. Great Britain and France spent much of that century fighting to determine who would reign supreme in North America and around the globe. These wars um, demanded large amounts of money and men. The British did not, therefore, have the resources to spare in expeditions of discovery. They had to defend their colonies in North America against the French. They could not afford to spend blood and money exploring an arid and desolate land. So, after Dampier's trip to New Holland, it would be another 70 years until an Englishman stepped foot on the Australian mainland. That Englishman was uh, called Captain James Cook. Now, James Cook was an unusual man. He is one of the two most famous members of the British Royal Navy, the other being Horatio Nelson. And yet, we know very little about Cook's personal life. His inner thoughts and private life were a closed book. During his life, he diligently kept journals that described his day-to-day -day life. In fact, there is probably no famous figure in modern times that has documented their lives as painstakingly as Captain Cook. His journals contain over a million words, and yet, we never really um, he never really speaks about himself. He writes about his adventures in a very detached, impersonal way. He simply writes about what he did that day. He only mentions his wife twice in his written work. He never wrote even a word about his children. And uh, this has made it ver very difficult for biographers to write about him. The historian, Alistair McLean, wrote a biography about Cook. In the prologue to that biography, he says, and I quote, far from being intended to be a definitive biography, what follows is no biography at all. A true biography is a fully rounded portrait, but there are colors missing from my palette. I do not know enough about the man. The material is just not there. This is but a brief account of his early apprenticeship to the sea, his development as a navigator and cartographer, and of his three great voyages. And this is perhaps enough to let us have an inkling of the essential Captain Cook. For he was a man, as he himself confessed, to whom achievement meant all. It was not what Cook said or thought that raised him to the ranks of the immortals. It was what he did. Let the deed speak for the man. End quote. I love that quote. I think uh, that it's an extremely well-written prologue. And... And I, I find it so interesting that this guy, who, who left us over one million words, uh, never really spoke about himself. I think there's something uh, quintessentially British about that. I think about my grandpa, who is uh, British. Uh, he, he thinks there's something self-indulgent about, about speaking about yourself. Anyway, I'm going to give a brief account of, of Cook's life. He was the greatest explorer and navigator, not just of his age, but of any age. When describing Cook, the French explorer, La Perouse said, he carried out work that was so all-encompassing that there was little left for his successors to do but admire it. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned that Cook rarely spoke about himself. Instead, he tended to simply describe what he had done. But there were, there were exceptions uh, that seem worth mentioning. In 1774, he made a journal entry this journal entry was written during Cook's second voyage. He was not far from Antarctica. The sails were so frozen that Cook described them as plates of metal. The cold was so intense that it could hardly be endured. Cook had gone further south 
than any man before. He was surrounded by ice and um, he was writing in his journal. And this is what he wrote. I'm quoting from the journal now. I will not say it was impossible anywhere to get further to the south, but, the, but that attempting it would have been a dangerous and rash enterprise. And I believe no man in my situation would have thought of doing it. It was indeed my opinion, as well as the opinion of most on board, that this ice extended quite to the pole, or perhaps joins to some land to which it has been fixed from creation. I, who had ambition not only to go further than anyone had done before, but as far as it was possible um, for man to go, was not sorry at meeting this interruption. Okay, so, so that's how Cook described himself. He described himself as a man who had ambition not only to go further than anyone had gone before, but as far as it was possible for man to go. If that quote doesn't inspire admiration in you, you are a small spirited person. He wrote those words in 1774. He was in a wooden boat that was roughly the size of a tennis court at the limits of the known world surrounded by ice. Pretty much his entire crew was sick. Shortly afterwards, Cook would himself fall, fall seriously ill with a bladder infection. Everyone wanted to go home, but Cook's ambition pushed him southwards further than anyone had gone before. His restless and soaring determination had brought him to the uttermost ends of the earth. It's difficult for us to appreciate this feat nowadays because we all have a mental map of the world in our minds. Um, it is growing increasingly hard in this machine age to understand how difficult what he had done was. But at this time, people had no clue what was in the most southern part of the globe. It was a totally unmapped region. It would be the equivalent nowadays of traveling um, to a planet so far away that we didn't even have a satellite image of it. Anyway, uh, this episode is going to be about Captain Cook. I'm, I'm going to give a brief overview of his life. I'm going to focus on his first voyage because he discovered the east coast of Australia on that voyage. I'll briefly mention things that happened on the second and third voyage, but I'm going to mainly focus on the first one. So you're not going to get the full scope of what this man accomplished. You're only going to get a fragment. But with a man like Cook, even a fragment is a lot. But before, before we get to Cook's uh, life, I want to give a snapshot of the world that he was born into. Cook was born in 1728 in Yorkshire, England. The last time we spoke about England, it was an insignificant country that had no colonies in the, in the New World. It had one-tenth the revenue of Spain, and yet it managed to smash the Spanish Empire in 1588. This victory opened the New World to the English, who began to settle in the Americas. They established an empire of their own, the British Empire. In the early 18th century, when Cook was born, the British had 13 colonies in North America. They had first settled in North America in the early 1600s. The population of Britain's North American colonies had been growing at an extraordinary rate. The British population um, in North America had been doubling every 25 years. The vast majority of settlers lived in rural areas. Over 90% of the population lived in small communities of less than 2,500 people. The British colonies in North America made their money from agriculture. Colonists sold fish, wheat, tobacco, timber, and other raw materials to England. They used the money that they earned from these raw materials to buy manufactured goods from the mother country. The British living in North America brought, uh, bought brassware, cutlery, tea, drugs, and fashionable furniture from England. Uh, this trade uh, greatly benefited both England and Britain. The British also possessed colonies in the Caribbean, which were far more profitable than their colonies in the North American mainland. In the 18th century, the sugar trade was the fastest growing and most profitable branch 
of international commerce. The British got rich producing sugar in the Caribbean, which they sold throughout Europe. The Caribbean colonies also produced cotton, tobacco, and coffee. These products were all in high demand throughout Europe and therefore highly profitable. The Caribbean economy was fueled by slave labor. Between 1720 and 1730, Britain is estimated to have transported over 100,000 Africans to the Caribbean. Uh, this was brutal for the slaves, but highly profitable for the plantation owners. Sugar, the chief export of the Caribbean colonies, made Britain rich. Indeed, this combination of slavery and sugar would lead to an economic miracle, not just in Britain, but throughout much of Europe. In the same way that, that we marvel at China's economic growth today, 18th century economists uh, marveled at the booming sugar industry. The sugar industry created a thriving middle class in Britain, um, and, and you know this was also this this middle class was also brought about because of trade in, in coffee and other goods that were produced in the Caribbean. Anyway, the merchant class got rich um, selling these things, and they began to er exert a huge amount of influence over the British government. A merchant land-owning oligarchy began to exert a huge amount of influence throughout Britain. To quote the maritime historian Paddy Padfield, the chief purpose of the British government was to fund the armed forces. 85% of annual expenditure went on the upkeep of the Supreme Navy and the Army. The armed forces owed allegiance to the Crown, but at bottom they were the striking arm of the merchant land-owning oligarchy that ran government and parliament. Now, I quoted that because it gives us a good impression of what Britain was like at this time. The mercantile class was in control of the country. The monarchy still existed, but true political power was in the hands of the merchants. England had transitioned from monarchy to oligarchy. The rule of blood and breeding was beginning to be replaced by the rule of money. Now, these merchants, who were effectively in control of Britain, had gotten rich selling coffee, among other things. Coffee from the Caribbean began to flood into Europe, and a web of coffee houses began to be established in London. These um, coffee houses were not just places to get a meal and a drink. They were a meeting place for merchants, stockbrokers, ship owners, scientists, dramatists, and philosophers. They were hubs of scientific, artistic, philosophical and commercial activity. Within the coffee houses, people spoke openly about a range of topics. Indeed, foreigners who visited London were amazed at the freedom that Englishmen enjoyed. In the coffee houses, people spoke about just about anything. They criticized monarchs and politicians, and they openly discussed heretical ideas. Throughout most of Europe, orthodoxy was preserved by royal and religious censorship and there was no concept of freedom of expression or indeed of individual rights. The King of France, for example, had the power to order imprisonment without trial for indefinite duration. In 18th century Britain, even the lowliest member of society had the right to be tried before a jury and could not be indefinitely detained. He could not be tortured until he confessed, and he was presumed innocent until proven guilty. The liberalism of English common law astonished European visitors. Voltaire moved to England in 1726. He had been forced to flee France after challenging a prominent member of the French aristocracy to a duel. The aristocrat responded by getting Voltaire arrested and having him thrown in prison without a trial. Fearing indefinite imprisonment, Voltaire asked to be exiled to England as an alternative punishment, which the French authorities accepted. Voltaire described England as the land of liberty. He said, and I quote, I think and write like a free English man. He contrasted England with his country of origin, France, which he associated with tyranny. This view of Britain was not only held by Voltaire, Indeed, many foreigners came to view England as the land of liberty. A German visitor described London as follows. A man may live according to his own mind or even his whim, 
the friend of arts and science, the friend of religious liberty, the philosopher, the man who wishes to be secure against political and religious tyrants, the man of business, the man of pleasure, can nowhere be better off than in this metropolis. Montesquieu's friend, Lord Chesterfield, said, No wonder that England produces so many geniuses. People there may think as they please and publish what they think. So England during the 17th and 18th century was considered a land of liberty. This liberty, combined with growing wealth, stimulated the British intellect. During this time, Britain produced literary, scientific, and philosophical geniuses. Isaac Newton, Daniel Defoe, Jonathan Swift, David Hume, Adam Smith, and Jonathan Locke all lived and worked during this time. Now, I'd like to briefly discuss some of Locke's ideas because I think he is probably the most important British political philosopher. His ideas would go on to have an enormous influence on British ideas about governance. His book, Treaties on Government, was published in 1689. In that book, he denied the divine right of kings, he rejected their absolute authority. In other words, he rejected the political order that had prevailed in Europe for most of her history. He believed that absolute monarchy led to the seizure of property, the imposition of taxes, and the imprisonment and suppression of political dissent. Locke believed that property rights were sacred. He didn't think that a king should be able to take your property simply because he was a king. No man should be above the law. Locke didn't only argue in favor of property rights. Indeed, he also argued in favor of religious tolerance. Between 1689 and 1692, he wrote three letters on toleration in which he argued that people should have religious freedom. To quote Locke, the business of laws is not to provide for the truth of opinions, but for the safety and security of the commonwealth and of every particular man's goods and services. In other words, it's not the government's job to tell you what to believe. It's the government's job to defend you from foreign invasion and protect your property from criminals. The idea that people should be able to believe whatever they like without fear of persecution is commonplace today. So commonplace that we take it for granted. But in the late 17th century, when Locke wrote this, it was a truly radical idea. And this idea was embraced almost wholeheartedly in Britain. In France and the rest of continental Europe, wars were still being fought over religion. Heretics were still being persecuted. In Britain, people were granted freedom of worship and could practice their religion without fear. In addition to flourishing in the arts and sciences, Britain was flourishing industrially and technologically. Indeed, in the early 1700s, Britain had the most advanced metal, glass, textile, and shipbuilding industries in Europe. They had experienced a sort of proto-industrial revolution. Ports and new manufacturing towns were rapidly growing throughout Britain. So Britain was coming of age. She had colonies in the New World. She was growing rich. She had a powerful navy. She um, had even more powerful merchants. And she was producing great scientists, explorers, writers, and technicians. And uh, she had come to see herself as the ruler of the waves. In 1740, the Scottish poet James Thompson wrote the famous poem, Rule Britannia. Uh, this poem is actually sung now. That's probably how you know it. But it began as a poem. Um, anyway, I think that that uh, song or poem gives you an insight into the mood at the time of Captain James Cook's birth, right? It was written in 1740, so he was roughly 12 years old when it was uh, first published. And it's a very uh, confident poem. It expresses a mood of confidence in Britain. But the truth is, when that poem was first written, Britain was not yet ruler of the waves. She had managed to overtake the Dutch, who had entirely lost their trading dominance by 1740 but she still had to compete with France. Between 1730 and 1740, French seaborne trade increased by 86%. French trade was equal, equaling or even surpassing 
the value of British overseas trade. In 1735, the French East Indies Company overtook the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company in value of sales. Like Britain, France had colonies in both North America and the Caribbean. Like Britain, she had ex experienced an economic miracle. So in the 18th century, France emerged as Great Britain's most dangerous colonial and trading rival. This rivalry would in large part define the 18th and early 19th century. The British definitively won during the Napoleonic Wars when France lost both Louisiana and Haiti. Britain became the undisputed ruler of the waves. But during this time, Britain and France fought to determine who would control the world, during the 18th century that is. They would fight in North America, India and the Caribbean. Each battle was fought to determine which power would control the region. The British conflict with the French would impact Captain Cook's life in no small way. In 1755, Cook would blockade the French coast to prevent them from sending resources to their colonies in Canada. During this time, he crippled and captured a large French vessel. In 1758, Cook sailed to Canada to help the British in their fight against the French Canadians. And the conflict did not stop there. When Cook began exploring the world, he had to compete with other French explorers. Indeed, the French almost discovered the east coast of Australia before Cook did. They were in the, wa the, the same waters at the exact same time. So that was the world that Cook was born into. Now that I have given a snapshot of what Britain was like at the time of Cook's birth, I think we can turn to our main subject. So as I already said, Cook was born in 1728. He was born in a small village in Yorkshire. Like Drake, Dampier and Tasman, he was of humble origin. Once again, we are dealing with a self-made man. His father was a farm laborer, and Cook did not receive a thorough education. He only went to school for five years. The education he received was extremely limited, and at the age of 13, he quit school and began working alongside his father on the farm. After a few years of working on a farm, Cook left home and moved to the tiny seaport of Staves. I've actually visited Staves a number of times. It's, it's very close to my grandparents' house. Anyway, he moved to Staves, again this is in Yorkshire, when he was 17 years old and worked in a grocery. But Cook did not want to spend his life behind a grocery uh, counter. After a year of working in the shop, he moved to Whitby where he took up an apprenticeship as a sailor. Uh, during the first few years of his apprenticeship, Cook transported coal from Newcastle to London. Later on, he made trips to Ireland and Norway. Now, little is known about Cook's personal or social life during this time. Apparently, he didn't have a social life. He spent all his free time studying algebra, geometry, trigonometry, navigation, and astronomy. These skills were all necessary for the command of a ship, and Cook taught himself them all. He was, therefore, an autodidact, a self-taught man. These study habits would stick with Cook for the rest of his life. He kept studying until he died. Anyway, uh, these study habits were noticed by his boss, who was astonished by the amount of time that Cook spent studying navigation, astronomy, and mathematics. Indeed, his boss was so impressed that he promoted Cook. Eventually, his boss even offered him command of a merchant vessel. This was an amazing opportunity, but Cook declined it. He decided to join the Royal Navy instead. He passed up the command of a merchant ship for the lowest rank on a naval vessel. This was a highly unusual decision. As the commander of a merchant vessel, Cook would have had status and money. In the Navy, he would have had neither. The lowest ranking members of the British Navy were treated extremely poorly and paid very little. As per usual, Cook offers no explanation for why he made this decision. So all we can really do is speculate Cook joined the Navy in 1755. In that year, Britain was preparing for war with France. Active fighting was already taking place in overseas colonies 
especially in North America. The British Navy had already begun blockading the French coast to prevent them from supplying the French in Canada with men and arms. The British had also been producing naval vessels at an unprecedented rate, but they were struggling to find men to join the Navy. Men were reluctant to join the Navy because of the brutal conditions of naval life in the mid 18th century. So there were not enough men to actually man the expanded Royal Navy. The problem became so bad that the Navy resorted to kidnapping people and forcing them to join. Heavily armed naval press gangs would often kidnap drunk men and force them to serve. It has been suggested that Cook volunteered to serve in the Royal Navy in order to avoid being press ganged. Other historians suggest that he was a romantic who joined the Navy to serve his nation. We will probably never know why he actually joined, but on the 17th of June, 1755, he did. Eight days later, he was on board a ship sailing towards France. He would spend the next couple of years blockading the French coast. During that time, he captured a French warship and sunk another. He also rose from the rank of seaman to master of the ship. The person in charge of the, you know, the, the master of the ship is the person who's in charge of actually running the ship. Um, it was very unusual for someone to do this in just two years. In 1758, Cook would sail to Canada. He was now 29 years old. The war in America was going badly for the British. The British colonists were in desperate need of assistance. The British attempted to assist the colonists by launching an attack against the city of Quebec. Quebec was a major French military stronghold. The capture of Quebec would dramatically weaken the French military presence in North America and take the pressure off British colonial forces. Now, Quebec is on the eastern seaboard of America. It is situated on the St. Lawrence River. If you're not acquainted with the geography, it could be helpful to, to pause the podcast and, and take a look at a map. Anyway, in order to attack Quebec, the British had to sail through the St. Lawrence River. The British Navy had lots of trouble sailing through this river. The historian Alistair McLean describes the St. Lawrence River as follows. It is a confusing and highly treacherous maze of rocks and shifting sandbars, a navigator's nightmare if ever there was one. If the British wanted to launch an attack on Quebec, they would need an accurate map of the St. Lawrence River. This job fell to Cook. He spent several weeks mapping the St. Lawrence River. He would identify, you know, rocks, sandbars, areas that were potentially dangerous to sail through, etc. Anyway, this was a difficult and arduous task. Whilst charting the river, um, Cook was frequently fired upon by the French. To avoid being shot at, he had to work at night during the hours of darkness. This made the act of charting the river extremely difficult. He was, however, able to produce an extremely accurate map. A couple of months later, a British armada of over 200 ships safely sailed along the St. Lawrence River to Quebec. They used a chart that had been created by Cook. This chart was clearly very good. Indeed, during this time, people began referring to Cook as a master surveyor. Now, the British assault against the fortress city of Quebec was successful. This was a crucial turning point in the broader conflict. It weakened French control over Canada and paved the way for British dominance in North America. After the siege and capture of Quebec, Cook would spend another three years in Canada. During that time, he charted the entire St. Lawrence River, and he was also put to use in mapping the jagged coast of Newfoundland. You can go and look at this map of, of Newfoundland online if you're interested in that sort of thing. If you are, you might be autistic, but anyway. Um, Cook was clearly very good at charting and geography. As I've already said, people began referring to him as a master surveyor during this time. The leader of the British Navy in North America sent Cook's charts of Newfoundland back to England. In um, the letter that was sent with the maps, he urged the Navy to publish them and said, from my experience of Mr. Cook's genius and capacity 
I think him well qualified for the work he has performed and for greater undertakings of the same kind. End quote. Now, these are obviously very prophetic words. They were written by Admiral Colville. Whilst mapping New Zealand, Cook would name a cape after this man. It was called Cape Colville. And today there is also a town in New Zealand called Colville. Anyway, after spending over three years in North America, Cook returned to England. He returned home in 1762. Because of the work he had done in Canada, the Navy considered him the greatest cartographer and navigator of a generation. The Treaty of Paris was signed in 1763, one year after Cook returned to England. The signing of the treaty formally ended the conflict between France and Great Britain in North America and marked the beginning of an era of British dominance. Great Britain gained much of France's possessions in North America. This was obviously good for the British Empire, but it was bad for Cook. The absence of war meant there was little for him to do. The next five years of his life would be relatively uneventful. He devoted himself to his studies once again. He spent a lot of time learning about astronomy. He even wrote a paper on eclipses, which came to the attention of the Royal Society. In London, in 1768, the Navy was searching for a marina capable of carrying out an unusual mission in the Pacific Ocean. They needed someone to sail to Tahiti and observe the transit of Venus across the sun's face. If the transit of Venus was accurately observed and recorded in multiple destinations throughout the globe, it would help establish the Earth's distance from the Sun. Establishing the Earth's distance from the Sun would, in turn, help navigators determine longitude. Uh, at this point in time, navigators could accurately determine their latitude, which is to say they could accur accurately determine how far north or south they were from the equator, but they struggled to determine longitude. In other words, navigators struggled to determine how far east or west they were. In the oceans far from Europe, the exact longitude of many important places was not known with accuracy. This caused huge problems for navigators. The British realized that they needed a more accurate way of determining longitude if they wanted to have a maritime empire that spanned the globe. By observing the transit of Venus from multiple different locations across the globe, they believed they would be able, uh, they would be better able to determine longitude. King George III played an important role in this scientific endeavor. Today, he is mainly remembered for the unsuccessful role he played in the American Revolutionary War. He is often depicted as an idiot. If you've seen uh, Hamilton, you'll know exactly what I mean. But during his own time, he was regarded as a man of great intellect. He studied physics and chemistry. He was one of Europe's keenest buyers of books. He was a patron of science and technology. But most importantly, for our purposes, he was a lover of astronomy. He loved to watch the night sky through the finest telescopes and he financed the world's largest telescope. From England, he himself planned to watch the transit of Venus from his own observatory. But more importantly, he gave the Royal Society 4,000 pounds to send men across the globe to watch the transit of Venus. This money would be used to send an expedition to Tahiti, among other places. So for this expedition to Tahiti, they needed a man with both skill in um, astronomy and navigation. Cook's name was quickly suggested. He was passionate about astronomy. Uh, as has already been said, you know, he, he published a paper on eclipses, which was read by the Royal Society. But, but he was also considered one of the greatest navigators and cartographers of um, his time. He was therefore the ideal candidate to lead this unusual mission in the Pacific Ocean, which was primarily a scientific mission. Cook was ordered to establish an observatory in Tahiti in order to record the transit of Venus. But Cook's brief also included a secret mission from the British government. After recording the transit of Venus, he was to search for Terra Australis Incognita. 
an unknown southern land that might prove to be both large and rich. The idea that there was a large continent in the southern hemisphere had persisted in European thought, despite multiple failures to find such a continent. In Britain, the idea of the southern continent was popularized by a prominent member of the Royal Society. His name was Alexander Dalrymple, and like Quiros, he was obsessed with Terra Australis. Uh, Dalrymple was born in Edinburgh in 1737, and he had sailed to the east as a young man. He was able to speak Dutch, French, and Spanish, and was a keen buyer of rare books and maps. From a young age, he had been fascinated by stories of exploration, and himself wanted to become a new Columbus or Magellan. He bought lots of books that dealt with the subject of exploration and geography. He um, read the works of Quiros and became a fervent believer in the great rich unknown continent of the south. Dalrymple hoped that he would himself be the hero of the last great story of discovery. He hoped to lead an expedition into the South Sea. He wrote a book in which he claimed that there was a large, undiscovered continent in the South. It should be emphasized that he was not talking about New Holland. He believed that this continent existed somewhere between South America and New Holland in the South Sea. What made him so confident that this continent must exist? Well, Dalrymple believed that there must be land in the South to balance out the land in the North. Otherwise, the world would spin like a top-heavy ball. If you think back to episode 1, you will remember that the Greek geographer, Ptolemy, made this exact same argument in 150 AD. So, Dalrymple was simply rehashing a very ancient idea. Anyway, Dalrymple was a geographer, and he had experience at sea. He believed that he should be appointed to lead a voyage to the South Seas to discover the missing continent. He was also a prominent member of the Royal Society. The Royal Society had significant influence over the government. Members of the Royal Society tried to convince the Navy to give him command of a ship. The leaders of the British Navy found Dalrymple's ideas convincing. They thought it was uh, more than likely that he was right. Um, furthermore, they were convinced that France might discover this continent before they did. They knew that she was trying to expand her influence and annex territories in the Pacific, and the British Navy was determined to curb her influence in the Pacific. They didn't want the French uh, taking over that uh, ocean. They had largely driven the French out of North America and India, and they were determined to drive her out of the Pacific. Uh, the British already, con already controlled one-eighth of the world, but they wanted to gain more territory. In the 1760s, the British Navy had sent two expeditions across the Pacific in order to find and take land. Now, on one of those two expeditions, they discovered Tahiti. Whilst in Tahiti, the men claimed to have seen a large continent in the distance. They actually described it as the long wished for southern continent. They believed that a canoe leaving Tahiti at sunrise could reach this continent by sunset. They also believed that the continent was occupied by a race of people with pale skin. On what grounds did they believe this? Well, whilst in Tahiti, one of the British men claimed to have seen several canoes arriving from the southern continent. In these canoes, he claims to have seen pale-skinned people who had a great resemblance to Jews. He also described them as jolly and fat. These chubby Jewish people sat in the canoes while some darker-skinned people paddled. They were the Jewish people's obedient servants. The British were unable to make contact with these uh, exotic people. They, tr they tried to send out a boat to go and greet them, but they had already left. So the British Navy actually thought that the southern continent that Dalrymple was talking about could very well be a Jewish colony based off what these uh, explorers had said, these British explorers. So the Navy decided to adopt Dalrymple's plan. They would secretly search for the missing continent 
but they did not appoint him commander of the expedition. The reason for this rejection was pretty simple. Dalrymple was not a naval officer, and he had limited experience as a navigator. He was rejected by the Royal Navy in favor of Cook. Now, Dalrymple was understandably upset by this. He was very envious of Cook and became extremely critical of him. If you think back to episode two of this series, you will remember that I um, discussed the theory that the Portuguese first discovered the east coast of Australia. The first person to advocate this theory was Alexander Dalrymple. As I said a moment ago, he was a keen buyer of rare books and maps. He discovered the Dieppe maps, which I talked about in episode two. He used these maps to suggest that the Portuguese had discovered the east coast of Australia hundreds of years before Cook did. Many historians believe that he advocated this theory simply to undermine Captain Cook's accomplishments. Anyway, Cook had been given two missions, the second of which was secret. He was first to observe from Tahiti the transit of Venus, and then, having charted the island, he was to proceed to the South Pacific to discover whether or not a large continent existed there. This was his mission. His boat was called the Endeavour. It was, as I said previously, roughly the size of a tennis court. On board, there were seamen, marines, painters, servants, and a scientific party appointed by the Royal Society. This scientific party included astronomers and botanists. The most important member of the scientific party was Joseph Banks. I'm going to describe Banks in some detail because he is probably the second most important character in our story. I'm, I'm going to be drawing on his diaries a lot throughout this episode. So um, Joseph Banks was an affluent bachelor. He made £6,000 a year from his country estates, which was a huge sum at that time. He was therefore the most wealthy person on board the Endeavour, and he actually paid for many of the ship's expenses. Um, he had attended both Eton and Oxford, but did not complete his degree at Oxford. Instead of completing his degree, he spent his time studying botany. Banks had become obsessed with botany at the age of 14, and um, unfortunately he wasn't able to study the topic at university because it, because it wasn't offered at that point. It was still an emerging field. Um, Banks had a reputation for being a playboy, but he also had a reputation for being a man of science. He desired to be a scholar of nature. Steadily, he built up his knowledge of botany and zoology. This is how the historian Robert Hughes describes him. At 25, Banks was well-educated, Eton, Oxford, well-connected, well-off, a rural, a rural fortune, and in the proper sense, a dilettante, one who took an eclectic, educated pleasure in the world about him. His passion was botany. On hearing of the expedition to Tahiti, Banks realized that this was his chance. To be the first botanist into the South Seas would make his reputation, for he would have the flora of a new world to himself. Any blockhead can go to Italy, he is said to have told a friend who wondered when he would take his grand tour. Mine shall be around the world. He would go with Cook. Friends in the Navy and the Royal Society arranged it. End quote. I'd also uh, quickly like to quote Alan Moorhead's description of Banks. Here it is. In later years, he was to become a very celebrated man indeed the virtual dictator of scientific affairs in England, the president of the Royal Society for nearly half a century, the rich and generous patron of innumerable activities, the confidant of a fashionable and intellectual world in London that was perhaps more brilliant than it was ever to be again. He was only 25 when the endeavor sailed from England and great wealth had combined with good looks and a buoyant affable nature to turn him into the very prototype of the handsome young man setting out on the grand tour from 18th century England. He had the easy, likable manners of Eton and Oxford, but he was not a fop in any way, nor yet an intellectual, nor a coming politician. He was an immensely enthusiastic amateur botanist, a genuine dilettante of natural history, 
His energy was inexhaustible, and his wealth gave him the opportunity to spread his wings. End quote. Anyway, on this voyage, Banks would make a name for himself as one of the greatest botanists of all time. He, bore, he brought back 30,000 specimens from this voyage, representing some 3,000 species of which 1,600 were wholly new to science. Around 80 species of plants now bear his name. Anyway, the endeavor left England in 1768. It began its long and dangerous journey to the Pacific. It is important to note that at this time, a ship's captain considered himself lucky um, if he could keep 75% of his original crew alive when sailing to the Pacific. But after eight months at sea, Cook's crew successfully made it to Tahiti. They arrived without one man on the sick list and without one case of scurvy. In those days, this was an unheard of achievement. Scurvy is caused by a vitamin C deficiency. The simple cure for it is fruit, especially lemons or oranges, and um, green vegetables. But most captains during this time did not know this. While sailing in the Pacific, Magellan's crew had to eat a mixture of biscuit crumbs and rat droppings to survive. Eventually, they even ate the rats. Once all the rats were gone, they had to resort to eating leather. Um, scurvy afflicted them so badly that to chew these you know, tough things, they had to keep slicing the swollen tissue of their gums away. And, th and this is what happens when you get scurvy. Your, your gums become um, extremely swollen and weak. And, and yeah, so, so when Magellan's crew would bite into something, it's almost like their gum, gums would just get totally cut up and, and broken down. And, and this, was, this was pretty common. Similar stories were just all too common during this time. Cook was able to avoid this problem by feeding the men sauerkraut, among other things. He had read about uh, this solution during his studies. Throughout the three-year voyage of the Endeavour, Cook did not lose a man from scurvy, a feat without precedent in the history of seafaring. After eight months at sea, Cook and the scientists stepped on shore. Both Cook and Banks described landing in Tahiti in their diaries, which I will now quote. This first quote is from Banks. As soon as the anchors were well down, the boats were hoisted out and we all went ashore, where we were met with by some hundreds of the inhabitants whose faces at least gave evident signs that we were not unwelcome guests, end quote. The Tahitians were afraid at first, but after a while they became more confident and began to take the foreigners on a tour of the island. To quote Banks' diary once again, we proceeded to walk for six to eight kilometers under groves of coconut and breadfruit trees, loaded with a profusion of fruit and giving the most grateful shade I have ever experienced. Under these were the habitations of the people, most of them without walls. In short, the scene that we saw was the truest picture of an Arcadia, of which we were going to be king, that the imagination can form. Of course, I think Arcadia means like utopia, paradise, etc, etc. So, so Banks was clearly impressed with Tahiti, he saw it as an earthly paradise. That's how he described it in his diary. The British walked through the tropical garden, distributing small presents to the smiling natives. But um, complications soon followed. I am now going to turn to Cook's journal. Uh, the day after the Endeavour arrived, we get the following journal entry from Cook. This morning, we had a great many canoes about the ship. The most of them came from the westward, but brought nothing with them but a few coconuts. Two that appeared to be chiefs we had on board together with several others, for it was a hard matter to keep them out of the ship, as they climbed like monkeys, but it was harder still to keep them from stealing everything that came within their reach." End quote. It was the same when they went ashore. Here is another entry from Cook's journal. Here, the natives flocked around us in great numbers, in as friendly a manner as we could wish, only that they showed a great inclination to pick our pockets. We were conducted to a chief who I shall call Lycurgus. Uh, this man entertainer, entertained us with broiled fruit, uh, breadfruit, coconut, etc. With great hospitality and all the time 
took care to tell us to take care of our pockets, as a great number of people had crowded about us. Notwithstanding the care we took, two men had their pockets picked. Uh, th this would be an ongoing problem in Tahiti. Again and again, the British would have their items stolen. For the British, private property was sacred. You know, th th these people, their, their main philosopher is John Locke, who talked about the sacredness of property rights. But this, this same conviction was not shared by the Tahitians. They continuously stole, much to the annoyance of the British. To quote the historian, Alistair McLean, once again, Almost certainly, they didn't understand the meaning of the word theft. For them, if you saw a thing and wanted it, you just took it. It was as simple as that. Anyway, after arriving in Tahiti, there were still several more weeks until the transit of Venus was going to take place. Cook decided to build a fort on the island where he could store his instruments and trade with the natives for fresh food. About 40 men from the Endeavour came on shore to help build the fort. Many of the Tahitians helped uh, in the building process also, probably not realizing that the fort was being built to actually keep them out. Cook uh, drew an image of this fort that you can find online if you're interested. Just type in Captain Cook Fort Drawing Tahiti and it, and it should come up. Inside the fort, there was an observatory which Cook um, built and he hoped to view the transit of Venus from this observatory. The British and the Tahitians were on increasingly good terms. Every morning at the gate of the fort, Joseph Banks purchased large quantities of coconuts, breadfruit, and occasionally uh, pigs. One of the Tahitian chiefs uh, moved his hut close to the fort so that he and his women could dine with the Englishmen every night. Banks would often spend the night sleeping in the open air outside of the fort. He was able to do this without any fear of being harmed by the natives. To quote his diary, I lay in the woods last night, as I often do. At daybreak, I was called by Mr. Gore and went with him shooting. We did not return till night. Banks loved to watch uh, these people swimming in the sea, and he gives us the first known description of surfing in the Pacific. I'm going to quote from his diary now. Whenever a surf broke near them, they dived under it with infinite ease, rising up on the other side of the wave. But their chief amusement was being carried on an old canoe. With this before them, they swam out as far as they could on the beach. Then one or two would get into it and opposing the blunt end to the breaking wave were hurried in with incredible swiftness. Sometimes they were carried almost ashore we stood admiring this very wonderful scene for fully half an hour. Anyway, so there you go. That's the, the first description of surfing in the Pacific and perhaps um, the first des European description of, of surfing. The food in Tahiti was some of the best the men had ever eaten. They ate roast pig and even roast dog. At first, the Englishmen were very apprehensive to eat dog, but they were pleasantly surprised by its taste. Cook compared it to lamb. The Tahitians, like many other Pacific Islanders, were covered in tattoos. Several of the Endeavour's crew, including Joseph Banks, had their arms tattooed. In so doing, they became the founders of the time-honored tradition of the tattooed sailor. The Tahitians had a religious ritual that was observed by Cook and his men. This ritual was unlike any that they had ever witnessed before. Barely dressed women dance in a sexually provocative manner whilst men play drums. This is how Cook described the ritual. A very indecent dance, singing the most indecent songs and using the most indecent actions in the practice of which they are brought up from the earliest childhood. The girls, Cook's, uh, Cook adds, on growing older or on getting husbands, abandoned dancing to the younger generation. But, and I'm quoting again now, both sexes express the most indecent ideas in conversation without the least emotion, and they delight in such conversations beyond any other. This naturally brings us to an infamous feature of Tahitian life, namely their attitude towards sex and sexuality, 
The captain of the last English expedition to Tahiti had declared that the girls were prepared to make love at any time for the most trifling gifts. The Englishman on the previous voyage had given them nails in exchange for sex. Um, there had been a co commotion on board the Dolphin, which was the name of the ship of, of this um, last expedition. When it was discovered that the sailors were sleeping on the floor because they had traded the nails that their hammocks hung from, um, the hammocks hung on, for sex. Um, the, the same thing happened during Cook's time in Tahiti. He had to lash one of his sailors 24 times for stealing a large quantity of nails from the storeroom. That said, Cook was not a prude. He didn't do this because he disapproved of like having sex with the locals or anything. He did this because the man had stolen a valuable resource. He actually allowed his men to mingle with the girls. He even allowed um, the women to sleep on board the Endeavour. In general, he seems to have been more amused than shocked by Tahitian morals. Early on, we find him writing, Upon the whole, these people seem to enjoy liberty in its fullest extent. End quote. Joseph Banks wrote, On the island of Tahiti, love is the chief occupation, the favorite, no, the sole luxury of the inhabitants. Both the bodies and the souls of the women are molded into the utmost perfection. Cook describes one funny incident that seems worth mentioning. It involves uh, Joseph Banks. Here goes. Mr. Banks was, as usual, at the gate of the fort trading with the people when he was told that some strangers were coming to see him. The company, which was made up of two women and a man, had with them about a dozen bananas. They laid these down about 20 feet from Mr. Banks. The people then made a lane between him and them. When this was done, the man, who appeared to be only a servant of the two women, brought the bananas to Mr. Banks, and at the, at the delivery of each, pronounced a short sentence, which we understood not. After he had thus disposed of all his bananas, he took several pieces of cloth and spread them on the ground. One of the young women then stepped upon the cloth, and with innocence exposed herself entirely naked from the waist downwards. In this manner, she turned herself once or twice round, I am not certain which, then stepped off the cloth and dropped down her clothes. More cloth was then spread upon the former, and she again performed the same ceremony. The cloth was then rolled up and given to Mr. Banks, and the two young women went and embraced him, which ended the ceremony. So, as I said before, Banks was a handsome young man, um, and there can be no doubt what this uh, ceremony meant. It was a proposal from the two girls that he should make love to them. The phallic symbol of the banana was presented and the women displayed their naked bodies. And to make their meaning clear beyond all doubt, the girls came and embraced him after the ceremony was done. A and Banks appears to have accepted their offer, if not on this same day, then on a number of occasions later on. There are many stories of women sleeping in his tent and one day, there was also a violent row between him and another Englishman over one of the girls. So, Joseph Banks was clearly an English lad. He was getting tattoos and sleeping with girls. He was on this, you know, this live, laugh, love world travel tour. Another thing that is worth mentioning, Banks actually learned the Tahitian language. So, he could speak Tahitian, he had Tahitian tattoos. Imagine how um, interesting he would have been to London High Society. He was this young, good-looking scientist who spoke Tahitian and had tattoos. Um, this probably would have been very exotic in 18th century London. Anyway, there, there is no evidence that Cook took a mistress, but he too was clearly charmed by the Tahitian women. His attitude towards Tahitian free loves seems to be very relaxed. So much so that even instances of pretty um, disturbing sexual behavior do not appear to disturb him. Uh, to quote another entry from his journal, The day closed with an odd scene at the gate of the fort, where a young fellow above six feet high lay with a girl 
about 10 or 12 years of age, publicly, before several of our people and a number of the natives. There were several women present who instructed the young girl how she should act her part, who, young as she was, did not seem to want it." End quote. It is interesting to note that Cook was not really shocked or enraged. Enraged. He simply describes what he saw. Um, you know, you've got to remember that the Victorian morality, right? This happens a hundred years later. So the, the attitude towards these things appears to be a lot more tolerant in the 18th century. Anyway, um, the relationship between the Englishmen and the Tahitians was overwhelmingly positive, but it was not without the occasional outburst of violence and conflict. One day, Cook learned that two Marines had took to the hills with their Tahitian girlfriends. They sent a, a message to Cook, telling him that they had no intention of returning. Um, this would not be the last time that this would happen in Tahiti. European sailors often fled into the hills with their Tahitian girlfriends. Indeed, this would end up causing one of the most famous mutinies in history. Anyway, Cook regarded this as a challenge to his authority. If he allowed these men to flee, others might do the same. Indeed, many sailors liked the idea of permanently set settling in Tahiti. Cook needed all the men he could get. He needed those men back quickly in order to set an example. Cook went and took a dozen of the Tahitian chiefs hostage. He told them that they would not be released until the two marines were, were returned to the ship. Cook had a remarkable ability to convince people that he meant every word he said. The natives immediately began to search for the men in the hills and they quickly found uh, these two guys and returned them to Cook. This incident is significant because it is the first time that Cook used this technique to get what he wanted. Cook was to employ this technique again and again throughout his life. Whenever um, anything of importance was stolen, Cook would seize local chiefs and hold them hostage until the stolen object was returned. As a technique, it was effective and worked like a charm time and time again, but ultimately it would lead to Cook's death. Whilst in Hawaii, the natives stole a longboat. Cook held the ruling chief hostage and told the natives that he would not be returned until the boat was returned. But Cook's men were eventually overwhelmed by the natives and the, the great explorer was stabbed. If you want to look at an image of this scene, I would highly recommend you look at the painting by the German neoclassicist Johann Zoffany. It's called The Death of Captain James Cook. Anyway, on the 3rd of June, 1769, Cook and the other astronomers prepared to view the transit of Venus. They entered the observatory that they had built and waited. Unfortunately, the observation did not go well, but this was not due to any fault of Cook's. The astronomical equipment that they had was not sophisticated enough to accurately observe the transit. After the transit of Venus, the English spent another six weeks in Tahiti. Cook circumnavigated and charted the island, but the main reason that they stayed for another six weeks was simply because they wanted to. They could not bring themselves to leave, but eventually they had to. They had a second mission to complete. They had to search for the missing continent, Terra Australis. When the Endeavour did finally leave, it was a painful affair. The English and Tahitians had grown extremely fond of each other and there was heartbreak on both sides. Many of the men were leaving behind Tahitian girls that they loved. Had they been given the choice, they would have permanently settled down with them in Tahiti. The chiefs, who had only recently been held hostage by Cook, begged him not to go. When the endeavor did finally go, hundreds of canoes followed it. This is how Alan Moorhead describes the scene. The departure was a painful affair. All past agitations and disturbances were forgotten. The chiefs bore no grudge for their confinement. They came on board the endeavour to say goodbye, overwhelmed with tears, and when the ship weighed anchor at 10am on 13th of July, she was surrounded by canoes filled with lamenting men and women. Banks climbed up to the masthead as they sailed away, 
and stood there waving for a long time. They left Tahiti behind and began to search for the missing continent. Hundreds of Tahitians had wanted to come with them, but they only allowed two of them on board. Cook actually didn't even want these two Tahitians to come, but Banks thought that they would be helpful. These are two Polynesian men who were very skeptical about the idea of the southern continent. They both knew the South Central Pacific well and had never heard of such a continent. Cook shared their skepticism. From the outset, he very much doubted the existence of the mythical southern continent. But Cook had an open mind and he was excited to put the theory to the test. If there was a Jewish colony in the Pacific, as some suspected, he was going to find it. They sailed south from Tahiti for over 2,000 kilometers. They spent months in abominable weather searching for the southern continent. They found nothing. The Pacific Ocean is larger than every other ocean. Even the Atlantic, extending almost from the North Pole to the South Pole, is only half of its size. In area, the Pacific is larger than all the lands of the globe added together. It is deeper and lonelier than every other ocean. Vast expanses hold no land, but that was not known when Cook set out. Indeed, most people thought that such a large ocean had to have equally large lands. Cook's skepticism about the southern continent increased with every day that passed. Alexander Dalrymple's theory seemed less and less plausible. The further south they went, the worse the weather conditions became. Indeed, the weather became so bad that Cook had to turn his ship around. He sailed northwest in search of better conditions. On the 7th of October, 1769, Cook and his men finally spotted land. Cook knew that they had arrived in New Zealand, that land that Tasman had previously visited. Tasman, the only other Pacific explorer who came anywhere near Cook's stature as a navigator and seaman, had visited the west coast of New Zealand 126 years previously. We spoke about him in episode 5. Anyway, nobody had seen New Zealand since Tasman's time. Only a fraction of the coastline of this land had been inspected by Tasman. Therefore, it was even conceivable, and Cook toyed with the idea, that New Zealand might prove to be part of the southern continent. The Englishmen on board the Endeavour were extremely excited. The mythical continent was discussed almost daily. Would it be the home of unfamiliar creatures? Maybe man-eating animals? Would it be another Tahiti? Would the inhabitants be well-clothed and living in houses? Would the people be white? All these questions and more were discussed on board the Endeavour. When they were close to land, they saw a large number of canoes. These canoes mesmerized the English sailors watching from the ship. The canoes moved with incredible swiftness. The men paddled in unison. Joseph Banks said the rowers were animated by the same soul. That's how in unison they were. They saw a canoe that was 68 feet in length and five feet wide. In the opinion of Cook, it could carry as many men as the Endeavour held, though its storage space was small. The men paddling in the canoes had tattoos all over their faces. Cook was not sure how to approach these men. He had read Tasman's journals, and he knew that they were violent. Indeed, when Tasman had arrived in New Zealand over a hundred years previously, they had killed a number of his men. Cook wanted to establish a good relationship with the Maoris, but he worried that they might launch a surprise attack against him and his crew, as they had done to Tasman. Cook eventually stepped on shore, carrying a Union Jack and some presents. He was the first European to actually step foot on New Zealand. Tasman, you know, had never actually stepped foot on this uh, island. Anyway, um, he had the Polynesian interpreters with him. When they got close to the Maoris, the, the Tahitians actually could recognize everything the Maoris were saying. To Cook's surprise, they perfectly understood them. Uh, this was quite shocking. The Tahitians had sailed thousands of kilometers from their home, and yet they understood the language of the Maoris perfectly well. Unfortunately, a shared language did not lead to harmony. The Maori were suspicious of these men. They had never before seen firearms or foreigners. They had never seen a ship of this size, and they had never seen men with white faces. What did these pale-faced men want? When Cook came ashore, he offered them presents, but they did not um, seem 
very interested in these. They, they were interested in the swords that the English were carrying. One of the Maoris uh, tried to steal an Englishman's sword. A fight broke out between the two of them and the English ended up firing their guns. One Maori was killed and three were injured. Banks was one of the Englishmen who fired. He regretted his decision and considered this the worst day of his life. Cook's first impression of this land was overwhelmingly negative. He decided to call the bay where they first landed, Poverty Bay. Cook gave this name because, to quote him, it afforded us not one thing we wanted, end quote. He had not gotten food or water and he had not established positive relations with the inhabitants. Till this day, this part of New Zealand is still called Poverty Bay. After this negative encounter, they decided to sail away. A few days after leaving Poverty Bay, they were approached by some Maoris on canoes. Uh, these Maoris offered them smoked fish in exchange for some cloves. All seemed to be going well. The two groups were trading instead of fighting for the first time. But all of a sudden, the Maoris kidnapped one of the Tahitian translators. The English managed to rescue him by firing cannons on board the ship. This scared the Maori so much that they returned the Tahitian. He was frightened but unharmed. They eventually arrived in a very fertile part of New Zealand that Cook called the Bay of Plenty. The land was very well cultivated. They were able to find lots of celery um, that was growing on the ground. And after being boiled on the big stove in the ship, it was fed to the crew basically every day. The sailors were able to get more oysters than they could possibly eat. They were able to establish good relations with the Maoris in this part of New Zealand. The Maori were happy to trade fish for British cloth. Cook, like the Dutchman in the previous century, had begun by establishing poor relations with the Maori. But as time went on, Cook's impression of them um, grew more favorable. He was able to trade with some groups of Maori and he considered them an active, strong and physically impressive people. They had more energy than the Tahitians, who he regarded as slightly lazy. The Tahitians, on the other hand, hated them. They looked down on them as inferior people. The European perception of New Zealand itself also changed. Uh, they came to realize that it was a very beautiful country and it had good quality soil. Both Banks and Cook believed that Europeans could settle there. It would be a good place to establish you know, pr productive farms. Anyway, Cook continued to make his way around New Zealand. He eventually found the northern tip of the southern island, and he realized that New Zealand was not one island, but actually two separate islands separated by a strait. Today, that strait is called the Cook Strait. Anyway, he found an inlet on the South Island, which he named after the king's young German wife, Queen Charlotte. This was a wonderful place. It was surrounded by steep timbered hills and it had a stream of fresh water. Uh, Queen Charlotte Sound was an excellent place for replenishing supplies and for refreshing the crew. Celery grass was turned into salads and fresh fish were caught. The ship was restocked with firewood and fresh water. After the six weeks spent in howling winds and swelling seas, this place was almost a paradise. The Maori living close to Queen Charlotte Sound were very friendly. Gifts were exchanged. The English traded iron nails and pieces of cloth for smoked fish. One day, Cook Banks and one of the Tahitian translators visited a Maori camp site where they observed two bones in a basket. These bones were left over from a meal the Maoris had just eaten. There was still some cooked flesh left on the bone. The Tahitian translator asked the Maori about the bones. He was told that they were the bones of a man, an enemy who had arrived in a canoe. The translator asked if they had eaten him. Their answer was yes. The sailors who had rowed Cook ashore were disgusted by what they heard. To many of them, this place was henceforth known as Cannibal Bay. Later on, a group of 10 Englishmen went ashore to collect vegetables and greens in uh, Queen Charlotte Sound. They did not return. A search party that set out the following day discovered that all 10 had been killed and eaten by the Maori. <laughs>
Anyway, Cook would spend a total of six months in New Zealand. During that time, he would circumnavigate and map both the North and South Islands. When Cook had arrived in New Zealand, it was but a line on a map. When he left, the entire shoreline of the two islands had been charted. It wasn't the mythical continent that everyone hoped to find, but it was a fertile and beautiful place. As one reads the journals of both Cook and Banks, it becomes clear that they believed New Zealand would make a good colony. In their journals, they drew up plans for colonization and provided the British government with a blueprint for how this could be done. To quote Banks, there are very large tracts of land which promise great returns to the people who would take the trouble of cultivating it. The timber in this country appears fit for any kind of buildings and thick enough to make masts for vessels of any size. Uh, end quote. He concludes by saying that New Zealand would be a great acquisition to England. This opinion was also shared by Cook. To quote him, It was the opinion of everyone on board that all sorts of European grain, fruit, plants, etc. would thrive here. In short, if this country um, was settled by an industrious people, they would very soon be supplied not only with ne uh, the necessities, but many of the luxuries of life. End quote. He even suggests um, a number of places where, uh, you know, that would make good first settlements. The natives were warlike, but Cook thought that they could easily be turned against each other. To quote him, It does not appear to me at all difficult for strangers to form a settlement in this country. The Maoris seem to be too much divided amongst themselves to unite in opposition. So Cook had established beyond a question that Dalrymple's fabled continent was not close to Tahiti or connected to New Zealand. He had also accurately mapped New Zealand and created a blueprint for its colonization, Cook began to think about what he would do next. He had accomplished all that he had set out to accomplish and was perfectly entitled to simply go home. The men had already been away for a year and a half and no doubt missed home, but the whole of the South Pacific was still a vast unknown. There was an enormous area of sea and land to their west that remained unexplored. The east coast of Australia was still a mystery to European geographers. Cook summoned his officers and men and told them that the voyage was going to be extended by another year. They would sail to what is now called Australia. In 1770, with favourable winds, the Endeavour sailed away from New Zealand and began sailing westwards towards the eastern seaboard of New Holland. After weeks at sea, the Endeavour finally spotted land. They were not far from the present border of Victoria and New South Wales. When the coast came into view, the chatter on board the Endeavour became intense. The people on board the ship wondered where they were. Would the local inhabitants be like the Tahitians or the fearless New Zealanders? And what language would they speak? Would their words, like those of the Maori, be intelligible to the Tahitian translators? These questions were asked again and again as the sailors got closer to the coast. Uh, when they spotted the land, they slowly began following it northwards, looking for a suitable, suitable place to anchor. As they sailed north, they spotted smoke rising from the coastline, and they occasionally saw aboriginals looking at them. The Englishmen were surprised to see that their presence didn't seem to interest the aboriginals at all. They showed no visible signs of curiosity. Nobody saw aboriginals waving to the ship or pointing weapons towards her. They simply ignored it. The aboriginals on the beach did not seem to be interested in the endeavour sailing through the water, even though she was much larger than any man-made structure that they had ever seen before, on sea or on land. After nine days of sailing northwards, they finally found a suitable place to anchor. They had arrived in Botany Bay. As the endeavour approached the shore, they sailed past some aboriginal fishermen who were in canoes, the fishermen didn't even bother to look up at the ship, which was over 100 feet long. To quote Banks, they scarce lifted their eyes from their employment, end quote. Cook would describe these canoes, and I quote, as the worst I think I ever saw, end quote. Each canoe was made up of a single piece of bark, which was drawn or tied at each end. When the Endeavour had anchored close to the shore, the men saw a naked woman on the beach, carrying wood. Banks tells us, She often looked at the ship 
but expressed neither surprise nor concern. Soon after this, she lighted a fire and the four canoes came in from the fishing. The people landed, hauled up their boats and began to dress their dinner, to all appearances totally unmoved by us." End quote. The Englishman sent two boats out for the shore. Uh, these people seemed calm and unmoved by their presence, so they thought they would be able to make a peaceful landing. They were wrong. Two Aboriginal men threatened them from the shore with long spears. No amount of pleading with them by signs had any effect, so Cook took a musket and began firing shots over their heads. This eventually scared them away. Uh, this would happen a number of times over the next few days. The Endeavour's crew spent a number of days ashore, gathering wood and gathering fresh water. The crew netted enormous quantities of fish in the bay, and there were giant oysters and other shellfish to be found on the rocks as well. Little groups of aboriginals would occasionally appear through the trees and stand for a moment to shout and throw a spear or two, then they would vanish again into the bush. Every attempt to offer them presents came to nothing. All they seemed to want, Cook wrote, was for us to be gone. This was of course the first time that aboriginals from that region had seen white people. The aboriginals believed that the white men were ghosts, more precisely, they believed that the white sailors were the spirits of their dead ancestors. They believed that these spirits were hostile and therefore wanted them gone. Uh, but the English did not go. They spent about a week in Botany Bay. Originally, uh, Cook had called this bay Stingray Harbour because of all the large stingrays they saw. But later he changed it to Botany Bay. He did this because Banks had found so many unique botanical specimens whilst there. The, uh, the botanist, wandering ashore, came upon trees and plants that had never been described before. The eucalypt, for example, and a shrub that eventually became known as the banksia. Uh, this was an extremely exciting opportunity for banks. Here grew hundreds of plants that had not previously been collected by a European. While uh, some had been seen by Dutch men who were shipwrecked on the west coast of Australia, they certainly had not been classified and named. Not only were new Australian plants collected and dried for safekeeping, um, but also new fish, animals, and insects. Um, initially, Banks had walked with a group of armed men whilst he collected the plants, but after a while, he, he started walking by himself. He was not scared of the Aboriginals. Indeed, Banks uh, described them as, and I'm qu quoting here, rank cowards. They spent a very pleasant week in Botany Bay. They had learned a great deal about the flora and fauna of Australia, but they had not learned much about the Aboriginal inhabitants. Uh, we could know but very little of their customs, Cook complained, as we were never able to form any connections with them." End quote. They were very different from the Tahitians and the Maoris. They were not friendly like the Tahitians, some were hostile and, and even slightly warlike. But, but they were not nearly as hostile and warlike as the Maoris had been. The Tahitian translators had a very low opinion of them. They described them as bad and poor people. They compared them to the lowest caste of Tahitians, the, the Titi, um, who were used as human sacrifices back in Tahiti. Anyway, after the week had passed, they continued their trip northwards. They sailed past what would later become Sydney, which is now one of the largest cities in the Southern Hemisphere. Cook depicted it on his map, but did not attempt to enter the harbour. As they sailed north, Cook noticed that the mood of his men was not good. They were growing wary of this adventure and were eager to reach civilization again. A month after leaving Botany Bay, they were still toiling slowly northward, nearly always in sight of the coast, but, but rarely actually landing. When they did go ashore, it was only for a few hours. They would collect some fish, you know, maybe some other things, and then leave. Cook mapped the coastline from the ship. On the 6th of June, 1770, the Endeavour arrived at Magnetic Island, which is, in, which is in the far north of Australia. It was called Magnetic Island because it affected the Endeavour's compass. They began to pass many tropical islands and coral reefs. Cook named these islands after members of the British aristocracy. Sometimes, when they sailed close to the shore, 
um, they saw groups of natives. But the, the same curious indifference persisted. Both men and women would, would gaze at them for a moment, um, they would look at the ship, and then dismiss it from their minds. If a, if a boat was put ashore, they quietly disappeared, leaving uneaten shellfish around the campfires. On the 11th of June, the Endeavour ran into the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, they struck the reef at about 11pm. Cook was awakened by the most horrible sound of the ship crashing into the rock. The ship rocked so violently that uh, he could scarcely stand upright. He ran onto the deck wearing his pajamas. The ship was stuck on the coral. He immediately ordered the boats and the anchors to be thrown overboard. But the ship remained uh, stuck to the coral. It wouldn't budge. Water began to pour in. They were 38 kilometers from the shore and there was no way that all the men could fit onto the lifeboats. The men could see pieces of their ship floating about them in the moonlight. When the tide began to go out, the ship became even more stuck and was at risk of being totally destroyed. Banks packed up his most valuable possessions and prepared to abandon ship. Cook did everything in his power to save the ship. Six guns were thrown overboard together with their cannonballs. Huge amounts of fresh water were also thrown overboard. The men spent the entire night pumping water out of their sinking ship. When the sun rose, they were still trapped on the coral reef. They waited for the tide to rise in the hope that it would pull them off the reef. When the tide did finally rise, the ship began to rock again and water began rapidly pouring in. Every man on board the ship, including Cook himself, was pumping water out of the ship. There seemed to be only one hope, that they could get the Endeavour off of the reef before the bottom of the ship was totally destroyed. At nightfall, the water was still pouring into the ship and they were still stuck on the reef. At this point, most people expected that, that, that they were going to die. They thought that they were dead. Um, at 10pm, after 23 hours of continuous labour, the ship began to move. There was nearly 4 feet of water in it. Now, many men on board thought the only thing keeping them afloat was the coral reef um, that the boat was trapped on. In other words, they thought that the coral reef was the only thing that prevented them sinking like a stone. But Cook decided to risk it. When the second dawn broke, they began sailing the badly damaged ship towards the mainland, and it stayed afloat. They managed to reach the shore, and, and they made a ramp. Uh, once they had made the ramp, they pulled the ship onto land. They were alive, but the Endeavour was so damaged that they could no longer sail in it. They had to try and repair her, but there were no boat sheds on this primitive coastline. They were in a tropical region, only 15 degrees from the equator. They had very few firearms, as most of them had been thrown overboard in order to lighten the ship. When they came ashore, many worried that they would be killed. In Botany Bay, Banks had described the Aboriginals as cowardly, but his attitude suddenly changed when he was shipwrecked in the tropical north. He worried that the Aboriginals might turn out to be very brave when facing sailors who didn't possess many firearms. To quote Banks, We have no hope of ever again seeing our native country or conversing with any but the most uncivilized savages perhaps in the world. End quote. They had landed in a place that is now known as Endeavour Bay, which is in uh, modern day Queensland. The bottom of the Endeavour looked like it had been attacked with an axe. The men would spend the next several weeks here trying to fix it. At first, the land uh, had appeared totally infertile and barren to Banks, but he quickly came to realize that this was not the case. Endeavour Bay teemed with wildlife and fish of all kinds. He spent his days studying the flora and fauna. This is how the historian, Alan Moorhead, described the men's time in Endeavour Bay. Cook and his companions were able to study the Australian scene much more closely than they had done before. They were diligent and enthusiastic observers, and they soon became aware that they were confronted here with something infinitely strange. It was as though they were looking straight back into the beginnings of creation. Thus, it is hardly surprising that there is a wonderful freshness in Banks and Cook's descriptions. Each day, while the ship was being repaired, they walked out into the surrounding bush 
and at every step of the way, they came on something new. End quote. As they walked, they saw thousands of brightly colored birds flying through the sky. They saw anthills that were six feet high, and they saw a strange creature, unlike any animal they had seen, that hopped on two legs. Banks described the kangaroo as follows. What to liken him to, I cannot tell. Nothing, certainly, that I have seen at all resembles him. They eventually managed to shoot one. It tasted like tough venison. Often, the men went out in boats and explored the Great Barrier Reef, a large wall of coral that runs for 1,600 kilometers or more down the East Australian coast. Not even in the Pacific Islands had the Endeavour's men seen such a teeming abundance of seabirds and tropical fish. They first made contact with the Aboriginals about a fortnight after they landed. Four men appeared and the sailors offered them presents. The Aboriginals put down their spears as a sign of friendship. They showed little interest in the, uh, the presents that they were offered, but they were very interested in the fish. And uh, yeah, the, the Europeans gave them fish and they very much appreciated that present. After receiving the fish, the Aboriginals tried to speak to them, but they were speaking in a language which uh, nobody understood. After this encounter, a larger group of Aboriginals began meeting with the Europeans every day. Cook and Banks were able to make notes about them. Indeed, uh, they would write the first really detailed description of Australian Aboriginals. Banks was surprised by how few of them there were. In the Pacific Islands, he saw large groups of Polynesians, but in Australia, he never saw a group of Aboriginals exceeding 30 people. To quote his diary, This immense tract of land, which is considerably larger than Europe, is thinly inhabited. We never once saw more than 30 Indians together. End quote. In Endeavour Bay, the place where they were stranded, the entire tribe consisted of 21 people. All of them walked around completely naked, which distinguished them from both the Tahitians and the Maori. In his diary, Banks described them as but one degree removed from the brutes. End quote. Cook was not as critical as Banks. To quote him, they are far from being disagreeable. They are an inoffensive race. They are not inclined to cruelty, yet they seem to have no fixed inhabitation, but move around from place to place like wild beasts in search of food. We never saw one inch of cultivated land." End quote. Now, of all the European explorers who arrived in New Holland, Cook probably had the most positive view of the Aboriginals. William Dampier, who we spoke about in the last episode, described the Aboriginals as ugly, poor, and miserable. The Dutch, who we spoke about in episode 4 and 5, described them as wild, cruel, man-eating black savages. Cook, by contrast, thought that they were quite good-looking. To quote him, their features are far from being disagreeable. He also thought that they were happier than Europeans. To quote him again, they may appear to some to be the most wretched people on earth, but in reality they are far happier than we Europeans, being wholly unacquainted with the unnecessary conveniences so much sought after in Europe. They are happy in not knowing the use of them. They live in tranquility, which is not disturbed by inequality." End quote. Banks was inclined to agree. Whilst walking around Endeavour Bay, he found the clothes that they had given the tribe just laying on the ground. They had been abandoned. He wrote, "'Thus live happy people, content with little, nay, almost nothing, End quote. Anyway, after seven weeks in Endeavour Bay, the ship was finally repaired. The men began the long journey home. They returned to England on the 12th of July, 1771. They had been away for over three years. Cook had accomplished everything that he set out to accomplish, and more. The transit of Venus had been observed. New Zealand had been charted. The undiscovered east coast of Australia had been discovered and mapped. The customs and habits of different peoples around the world had been described at length. 1,600 botanical species, completely new to European science, were brought back, and a rough plan for colonization had been made. This voyage alone would have made Cook one of history's greatest explorers, but he would go on to complete two more voyages that were equally impressive. In my estimation, these three expeditions firmly established his legacy as the preeminent explorer of all time, surpassing even Columbus.
The only challenger capable of dethroning him, perhaps, is a future interstellar traveler, exploring planets that are not yet known to us. But the thing that really interested the public about Cook's journey was the philosophical aspects of his discoveries. If the Tahitians really were living such an idyllic life, why should Europeans disturb them? If the Aboriginal Australians were in fact happier than Europeans, as Cook suggested, why should the British colonise their country? These questions, in some ways, predated Cook's voyage. The French philosopher, Montaigne, wrote an essay in 1580 that was titled On Cannibals. Uh, in this essay, Montaigne describes the life of the Brazilian Indians. Interestingly, his description of the Brazilians is very similar to Cook's description of the Aboriginal Australians. To quote him, this is Montaigne, We may call these people barbarous in respect to the rules of reason, but not in respect to ourselves, who in all sorts of barbarity exceed them. Their wars, in comparison to ours, are noble. Their disputes are not for the conquest of new lands, for these they already possess in such abundance that they have no need to enlarge their borders. And they are, moreover, happy in this, that they only want as much as their natural necessities require. All beyond that is unnecessary to them. That last part of the quote is worth repeating because it's almost identical to what um, Cook said about Australian Aboriginals. He says, they are, moreover, happy in this, that they only want as much as their natural necessities require. All beyond that is unnecessary to them. Again, uh, that is almost identical to what Cook said about Australian Aboriginals. A similar argument was made uh, by the French philosopher uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In 1750, Rousseau published an essay in which he argued that civilization corrupted people instead of improving them. To quote him, In the earliest times, simplicity prevailed and men were innocent and virtuous. Uh, end quote. Rousseau would go on to denounce private property as the source of all evil. He argued that it undermined equality and led to crimes, war, and murder. Again, this sounds very similar to Cook's description of Aboriginals. Cook had said that the Aboriginals were not warlike or cruel, had no inequality, and lived in a, a state of tranquility. Um, the journals of Cook were published and read throughout Europe. Their observations appeared to validate the ideas of both Montaigne and Rousseau. The simple communal life that uh, Cook and Banks described appealed to many Europeans. And uh, the appeal wasn't only theoretical. Indeed, two sailors on board Cook's ship had tried to stay in Tahiti. Uh, th they thought life in the Pacific was superior to life in Europe, and they tried to vote with their feet. When the official account of the Endeavour's voyage came out in 1773, these issues were vigorously debated. Two intellectual camps began to emerge. One camp was on the side of the Enlightenment. They believed in science, reason, and progress. They argued that scientific and technological improvement could improve the condition of man. The other camp was on the side of nature and the primitive. They argued that technology and science corrupted man, that industrial civilization was making man sick, that city life corrupts and pollutes, that the best man, in short, was the savage man. The other side, by contrast, promoted the modern man, the man of reason and science. If the Aboriginals really were happier than Europeans, as Cook suggested, then the idea of progress was nonsense. Therefore, the Enlightenment camp attacked and satirised Cook's account of the Aboriginal Australians. Now, it's important to note that these two camps still exist. They have battled one another since the 18th century. Neither camp has been able to reign supreme over the other during that time. Consensus has never been able to be completely achieved. But in the year 2024, it's clear that the primitive camp is well and truly winning. This will strike some as an unusual conclusion. Our age is a technological age. We are totally divorced from nature. But that's exactly what makes the idea of the primitive so appealing. Many of us are disaffected with technology. We, we yearn to return to a more natural way of life. That's why health food stores are recording record profits. It's why people are walking around with no shoes on and talking about the benefits of earthing. It's why a dot painting in a cave 
is held up to us as an achievement, but, but a cathedral is not. It's why a boomerang is considered an achievement, but synthetic fiber is not. It's why an eel trap is an achievement, but a rocket ship is not. It's why bush medicine is an achievement, but open heart surgery is not. It is, it's why yam farming is an achievement, but Captain Cook's three voyages around the world are not. It is primitive cultures that we are asked to study, to appreciate, and to respect. Any sort of culture except our own. We totally romanticize the primitive and denigrate, uh, you know, the civilized. We denigrate Western civilization whilst romanticizing uh, primitive cultures from around the globe. Personally, I think that open heart surgery is more impressive than bush medicine. I think that a rocket is more impressive than an eel trap. And I think that Captain Cook's three voyages are pretty much more impressive than anything you can think of. I think that Captain Cook deserves to be venerated. I think that Captain Cook deserves to be idolized. I think that Captain Cook deserves a statue, okay? And small-spirited people are going to disagree with that. Uh, the real reason that his statue was taken down is not because he's a bad person, which is what they say. The reason that his statue was taken down was because he was a great person. He accomplished great things. And nothing, nothing makes small-spirited people, the resentful people, nothing makes them more upset than greatness. Great things upset little people. And that's exactly what's happening. Go and let's see if they do decide to replace it. Let's see who they put on a pedestal. I guarantee you it's some little person, some little inoffensive person. And that's increasingly what we're becoming as a people. Little, inoffensive, harmless people. But we weren't always like that. We were once a scientifically orientated, aggressive, courageous, adventurous people. That's what Cook was. That's what Western civilization is. That's what we could become again if we could just throw off this moral outlook that has plagued us for too long. So anyway, um, this was my episode on Cook. A great man, a man worthy of being venerated, a man who deserves a statue. That's what I believe. Anyway, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And um, there'll be one more and then we're done with this and we'll move on to a new topic. Thanks again.